Hello everyone, welcome to this video about a topic that has been bugging me for quite some time and I kind of summarize it in the title Talking a good solo versus playing a good solo. It is a real problem in jazz education and it seems to be a symptom of our time. Let's get into it. Before we get started, a little disclaimer. Everything I'm saying in this video is purely my opinion. It's based on my experience with being a jazz musician and it might be very far from the truth. I just thought it would be interesting to have this discussion. So yes, this will be a rambling video. I am holding a guitar, but it's just in case I want to demonstrate something. I don't know, maybe because I don't have a script. I have some notes to keep me on track because it's very easy for me to get lost in all kinds of segues and diversions and not get to the point. And I want to talk about the difference between talking a good solo versus playing a good solo. And it means exactly what you think it means. It is the difference between somebody that can explain to you what to play over certain chord progressions, like which scales, uh, which modes, which arpeggios, which extensions, flat 9, flat 13, sharp 11, how to use motifs, how to use inversions, how to use enclosures, all that stuff, versus somebody that just picks up his instrument or guitar, let's keep it to guitar, and plays a great solo, and you know nothing else. You don't know anything about his knowledge. Does he know any theory or anything about modes or skills? You might assume he has to because he's playing a great solo, but that is why I make this video. I am claiming that there is no relationship between knowing that stuff and playing that stuff. It's no causality, right? The, the knowledge doesn't cause the good playing or vice versa. For starters, of course, there's the obvious observation that to play an instrument, it requires certain skills that you don't need to be a master of theory. You need to have good technique, you need to develop good timing, play with a good sound, use phrasing, inflections, embellishments, all those things you can of course describe in words, but I think anyone can deduce that it doesn't mean that you can actually also do it. But there seems to be a massive confusion about theoretical knowledge when it comes to harmony or improv language. Many people believe that the, the time you spend studying that theory from videos or books is just as valuable as the time you spent playing those things on the instrument. My argument is that there is no relationship between those two. So obviously the time you spent learning theory from books and videos is a waste of time if your goal is to be able to play well. To prove this, I actually made a real argument. I just came up with it. There might be some things wrong with it, but I think it makes the point. Premise one would be, there are great, highly regarded improvisers that don't know anything about theory, right? Harmony, improv language. This is a fact because I am good friends with people like Stochler Rosenberg or his brother Moses Rosenberg or any of the other Sinti. And those are highly regarded, very good improvisers that don't know anything about theory. They don't even know the names of the chords. They don't know any skills or any arpeggio by name, but they're great improvisers. So that's premise one. Premise two is there are people that have great knowledge in theory, but are not highly regarded improvisers. This is obviously also true, right? There are theory teachers. For instance, there are classical music theory teachers that might not be good jazz improvisers. I'm, I'm talking about jazz here. So those premises are both true. So the conclusion is there is no relationship between having theoretical knowledge and being able to play a good jazz solo. Now you might say, well, that sounds right, but I would say there is no necessary relationship between those two. But here's the thing. I'm saying there is no relationship. If you're saying there's a third group of people that use their knowledge while playing, I would say, well, there is no proof for that. If it is possible to play complicated things on guitar without knowing what they are, then obviously there is no relationship between those two. The fact that you might know what it is just means that you've developed two separate skills. You, you've developed the skill of a theory expert and you've developed the skill of an instrument expert. And if that is true, I think there is another conclusion we can draw, although both skills might be worth pursuing, right? You might really want to be a theory expert. I think it is obvious that to most people, it is more useful to spend time with the instrument learning how to play without spending time on theory. Why? Because I suspect that most people actually want to be able to play that stuff more so than 
knowing that stuff. They might want to do both, but if they have to choose, let's say a choice can be made, then they would choose for playing just because they want to be playing musicians. I want to be a playing musician. That would be an easy choice for me. And this is exactly where it goes wrong for a lot of people that are studying jazz, especially beginners. And I want to describe a situation that has happened many times to me. When I'm teaching someone, a student, nowadays it's mostly, of course, through Zoom or Skype. What happens a lot is that we start a lesson and I say, well, what have you been working on? And then they might say, well, I've been working on altered uh, skills, working on trying to pay um, B flat minor on top of A7, right? So this sound, let's say to D minor. And they talk about that and how they did it. And then I would say, okay, let me hear it. And then they start playing and it's not happening. They might be nervous, but also I can see from the choice of notes that those lines don't really resonate with me as an experienced jazz musician and lover of that music. But when they were talking about it, it seemed that they were grasping the concept. My conclusion would then be, they obviously spent more time thinking about it than playing it. So then I would say, okay, just play this line. Right, and then they would copy that line and we would be talking about which fingerings and the pick motions and the timing. We wouldn't be talking anymore about that there's a flat nine and flat 13 in it. So in my opinion, that student has the wrong priorities. It should be the other way around. It should be like this. I ask, so what have you been working on? I said, well, I've been working on this. And he turns on the backing track. He starts playing altered lines and they all sound great. And I would say to him, oh, you've been working on, on your altered lines. And then he might say, altered lines? Is that what it's called? Oh, okay. Now I know that. And that is the right order. First we play, first you play something. And then later on, you might be interested in what it is called and how it works, but it's not necessary. You can also play this stuff without knowing how it works. In fact, I think that road is much quicker. Instead of learning something and then also learning about the names and the theory, you can start working on the next thing you want to learn. Now, of course, if you're a teacher at university or you're a theory teacher, or you want to be able to have conversations about it, then of course you should also learn what things are called and in some situations might be very handy. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying it is absolutely unnecessary to know it, to be able to play it. I've even encountered situations where people were able to play something and then they never do it. And the reason is because they don't know what it is and they can't live with the fact that they might play something which sounds great without knowing what it is, right? They first have to know what it is before they are allowed to play it. But this is ridiculous. If that were the case for everyone, then Stockholm Rosberg would never be allowed to play. Of course, that is bizarre. Why would you only allow yourself to play something once you understand it? No, if it sounds great, then play it. And you might encounter someone that says, oh, you're doing that thing. No, if you do it like this, it sounds even better. And then you make some slight alterations. That's the way it should go. So in short, I think the priorities of the student, but of most people are wrong. They're either thinking that the theory is more important than the practicing, or they might even think that it is equally as important. I'm saying no, no. Only the playing is important. The theory is not important depending on your goals. But if the goal is that you want to play well, then the theory is unimportant. So that means it's a waste of time to spend time on it. Now I thought of some analogous situations where most people would agree with this statement. One of those situations is sports. I think everyone would recognize that there is a big difference between an athlete and a sports analyst. For instance, there are people that know all the betting averages and all the statistics in baseball by heart. It doesn't mean that if you put them on the field that they will be able to actually have a decent betting average or hit that home run. People that are on the field are athletes that have proven that they can perform at the highest level when it counts. And nobody is interested in if this person knows anything about baseball statistics. Now, it might be fun after the game to talk about baseball statistics or have a good-hearted disagreement about it. Those things are all fun. And talking about music theory is fun too. I like it. I know music theory and I like talking about it and uh, I like even like showing concepts and sitting at the piano or guitar and showing how chords move. I like all that stuff. But I also realize that has nothing to do with being able to play a good solo on a, on a standard. When somebody counts to four, one, two, one, two, three, four, can you play a good solo? Yes, has nothing to do with your theory knowledge. Has everything to do with the amount of time you spend on the guitar actually practicing that specific skill. So let's get back to the sports analogy. So we have the athlete, 
we have the sports analyst, and then we have a coach. So there are many coaches that used to be athletes, might not have been athletes at the highest level, but they were athletes. And then they became a coach when they didn't have the physique to be an athlete anymore. A coach, I would say in jazz music, is a teacher, someone that can teach you how to play well. So what is a good coach? A good coach is someone that can make an athlete perform at a higher level. And a teacher in jazz should be the same thing. Should be someone that can say the right things so that you start performing better. And that is also, I think, how you should pick your teachers. And that might be different for different people. For instance, my lessons are all about describing the vocabulary of the greats. I just call them licks and applying them on jazz tenders. That's all I do in my videos, right? I show you the great line. I say, oh, that's a two, five, one in D. You know, let's play it in C. I never spent any time saying, you know what, it is actually a D minor uh, arpeggio going to a double stop uh, consisting of the flat nine and the sharp nine of G7. No, I, I don't talk about that. I talk about how my fingers move and uh, the picking directions and how to have good articulation and good timing. And then we just apply it on different songs. And I tell you, it fits on a 2 5 one 2 c For instance, that's all I do. For some people, this might not work. I don't know why, but because I think this is the easiest way to learn how to play jazz. But some people might need another approach. They might need fingerings for skills, stuff like that. So that is, of course, your own assessment. But I think it is important to recognize if the methodology of a teacher is not working for you, that means that you found the wrong coach. You, you should find a coach that actually helps you perform better. Another way to gauge that is to either hear the teacher play himself or hear one of his or her students. Because if you cannot find any of that, then you don't have any assurance that the methods of that coach actually works. And it works the same way in sports. If a team hires a coach, they're gonna hire a coach with a good track record, or they're gonna, if it's a new coach, they're gonna hire a coach that used to be a very good athlete themselves. Because otherwise, there's no way to tell if their teaching or coaching methods are actually effective. Let's go to another analogy that I think most people would agree with. And that is the difference between a native speaker and a linguist, right? A native speaker is somebody that is born in a country or has lived there from a young age and has mastered the language of that country, which means it's very fluent. They can tell a story. Uh, they can tell a joke, right? They understand everything somebody says. They can react in an adequate manner. They can talk in such a way that everybody around them understands it. It is very natural. A linguist is somebody that is an expert in a language or languages, but not in the sense that they are a native speaker, but in the sense that they know how the grammar works, how the language developed, where the different dialects of the language are located. They know all that stuff, but they might not be able to speak it fluently, and certainly not as well as a native speaker. Of course, there are also native speakers that are also linguists, but those are two different skills, and everybody can see that. The native speaking has been developed during childhood, and the linguistic skills have been developed during a study at the university. There are linguists that are experts in multiple languages, like Asian languages or Celtic languages, and they know the differences between those languages, and they can teach you certain rules of those languages. But when you would ask a language, oh, can you tell me a, a great story in Korean, they might not be able to do it. They might be able to do it a little, but native speakers will probably do a much better job at telling that story because they are experienced storytellers in that language. And a linguist, by definition, is not an experienced storyteller because that is not a part of being a linguist. So somebody can be both a native speaker and a linguist, but one doesn't require the other one. And I think everybody can see that. Those situations are exactly like being a good jazz improviser and a theory expert. But I'm claiming that there are separate skills which require separate paths to mastery. If you just want to be a player, then spend all your time actually studying, playing on your instrument. If you want to be a theory expert, spend your time doing that. And if you want to be both, you have to spend twice the amount of time. But you could have also used the time that you spent on theory on learning how to play even better. Just something to consider. To end this video, I want to teach you something that you can play. And this is also the impulse that made me make this video. There is a great channel on YouTube by the name Isaac Raz. I don't know how you pronounce his last name, Raz, Raz. He's a piano player and he's a student of Barry Harris. And he's talking about Barry Harris concepts. And I enjoy watching those videos, but I have to say, I usually skip to the parts where he's actually playing something. And then I just transcribe that and learn that, learn like the, the shapes on the guitar. Because 
The moment he starts explaining the concepts, I lose track of what is happening. And I also don't know if this something is gonna sound great, right? I, I wanna hear if it sounds great. So I, I find the parts where he's playing, it's like, oh, that sounds great. Okay, let's just figure that stuff out. And then the explanation that comes before it or sometimes after it doesn't interest me that much because it's so abstract and it doesn't help me. It might be different for other people. So one thing he was showing was these chords to resolve to C. And that's something he calls major chromatic, something like that. And that has something to do with the scale that you add some notes. Not important. I would say just learn these chords and use it. Of course, we're on guitar, so the shapes are gonna be this. But there's tap in the screen right now, so it's gonna make it easy. Now, if because we're guitar players, I'm gonna just say the chord names. That makes it easy, right? So I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna go to the key of C, so just Start with the C in the bass and then play a D flat triad on top of it. Then move two frets up and play a C with a B flat in the bass. This shape. Then we're gonna go to this weird chord, which is just a pitch collection from, I guess from a diminished skill, right? Yeah, from diminished skill. So I would say, think about Think about this chord, the B diminished chord with the, uh, or think about E7 sharp nine with the B in the bass. And then just let go of your third finger and flatten your first finger. And then play two six chords with the fifth in the bass, so F6 to E6, and then resolve to C. So you can do whatever you want, you can play, or you can do, or any forcing you know for G7 to C. So. Really nice way to end the ballad, for example. I will link the original video that I got this from in the description and watch that video and see if you if you know what I mean, right? The theory explanations, although done very well, are very dry and it's not until you hear how pretty it sounds that you think, oh, that's something I wanna learn. Now it might be different for piano players, by the way, because it's a different instrument, but on guitar, the shapes are all we need, of course. So I hope I didn't offend anyone because I'm a great fan of a lot of theory teachers because it's just interesting to me. It's interesting, but I want to make clear that not to confuse that with actual skill of playing. There are also theory teachers on YouTube that are great players, but I'm saying those are separate skills, even if they might not see it like that themselves. In their head might be very linked, but uh, I'm saying that I don't believe that. Anyway, that was it for this video. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up. If you didn't like it, hit the thumbs up button twice and maybe subscribe to my channel. If this is the first time you see a video of mine, check out some of the other videos and see me play a lot and teach you some cool licks. And I will see you all in the next video. Bye.